Egypt is littered with fantastic ruins, all created to preserve Pharaoh's name and glorify the ancient gods. For nearly 2,000 years, ancient builders were pushed to their limits to create the most dramatic, the most impressive temples and palaces ever known. Perhaps the most difficult challenge of all was to raise an obelisk. Carved from a single piece of granite, an obelisk could rise over a hundred feet and weigh up to 500 tons. How did they do it? In 1994, a team of experts traveled to Egypt to tackle the problem. But their attempt to erect an obelisk, just a fraction of the size of the ancient ones, fell short. Tonight, Nova returns to the land of the pharaohs. Oh, there's Modern engineers take another look at the evidence okay. and try out a radical new solution to an age-old mystery. Well, you want the system change? I, know, I, want, I want it to work, y'all. I know, I want it to work as well, which is why you only want to Ropes and nerves will be strained as another team struggles to recreate the amazing deeds of an ancient empire. Kingdom was in its first bloom Pharaoh was God. All the country's riches were piled into his tomb, a man-made mountain for an immortal king. But a thousand years later, times had changed. A new god ruled the land. His name was Amun. New kingdom pharaohs like Ramses, Thutmos, and Tutankhamun still proclaimed their own divinity. Yet they were all beholden to the king of gods. So they built magnificent temples to him, filled with colossal statues and giant needles of stone, the obelisks. Hieroglyphs proclaim the pharaoh's loyalty. At the pinnacle was a small pyramid sheathed in silver and gold. Dedicated to Amun-Ra, the sun god, the obelisks were sparkling shafts of sunlight rendered in stone. For the pharaoh's subjects, the effect was awesome. It was a special effect. But they really believed in this special effect. It wasn't like Las Vegas or Hollywood. It, it was an effect that really happened for them. For over 25 years, archaeologist Mark Lehner has been probing the meaning of Egypt's monuments. He believes that colossal statues and obelisks helped Pharaoh maintain his power over the Egyptian people. It was a way of controlling people's perception. It was important for the pharaoh to have gigantic statues, gigantic obelisks where he mingled with the heavens because it was the perception of pharaoh's power at the pinnacle of society that held Egyptian civilization together. 3,500 years ago, along the banks of the Nile, monumental construction was routine. But now, it seems incredible. How did Egypt manage to build so much on such a colossal scale? How could Pharaoh's builders transport and erect stones weighing hundreds of tons in an age without cranes or steel cables? A 
team of experts will try to solve the mystery. They have three weeks to look at the evidence and recreate the Egyptians' remarkable achievements. Slowly the boat, the boat takes shape. The first major challenge our team will face is how the ancient builders move giant, multi-ton blocks of granite. One of the most important clues was found in the tomb of an official who lived almost 4,000 years ago. There's one tomb scene in all of ancient Egypt showing them transporting a colossal statue and you see the colossal statue mounted on a sledge being pulled overland and there are about uh, four lines of rope going out with teams of young men dragging the statue along. Most of the evidence, and there's some other evidence as well, suggests that these things were pulled overland on lubricated surfaces mounted on a sledge. To bring the ancient scene to life, stonemason Roger Hopkins joins Mark Lehner and a large Egyptian crew in an attempt to drag a 25-ton block set on a wooden sled. Directing the effort will be Raiz Abdel Alim. The Egyptian foreman has built a roadbed with wooden timbers set into the earth. To reduce friction, the wood is smeared with animal fat. Abdel Alim has a lot of experience moving heavy weights. But he usually relies on cranes and flatbed trucks, not dozens of men. The stone should move easily, with less than a hundred pullers, at least that's what Roger hopes. I would think 75 would be sufficient once you get that initial motion going. Once you get the block in motion, then they, you know, decreases the amount of friction and it should pull right along. To break the static friction, Abdel Alim orders the teams of men to bounce the stone with large levers. But with more than a hundred pullers, the only thing moving seems to be the rope, which stretches more than anyone expected. What, they cement this thing down? I wasn't here when they put this on the track. Part of the problem is that the men on the ropes are not pulling together. Well, we don't have a unified jerking movement to get it going quite yet. Roger decides that the men need a little extra motivation. Finally, with Roger shouting, God is great, in Arabic, the stone lurches forward. According to ancient accounts, the pharaohs had no problem gathering workforces that numbered in the thousands. Some were slaves, others prisoners of war, but many were Egyptian soldiers, fulfilling their duty to their king and their god. Our crew remained enthusiastic, even though after several hours of hard work, they moved the stone only about 20 feet. Dragging gigantic monuments is extremely slow and labor intensive. Yet the ancient Egyptians managed to transport huge obelisks and statues hundreds of miles, from granite quarries in the south to the capital in Thebes and further north to Memphis and Heliopolis. Luckily for these long journeys, the Egyptians had a unique highway at their disposal, the Nile.
But for the river, Egypt would be a wasteland. The Nile's life-giving waters flow northward from the Ethiopian highlands, transforming the African desert into lush, verdant farmland. All life revolved around the river, so one form of transportation was valued above all others. The country of Egypt basically was the banks of the Nile. People were totally tied to the river. During the inundation season from the middle of August to about November, the Nile Valley was one big long lake and the villages were little islands appearing within this lake. So the only way to get about was by boat. And that meant that there were boat builders all up and down the Nile, building small fishermen's boats. There were people building medium-sized boats and yachts for noblemen. Everybody had to have a boat to get along. Thanks to the Nile, the Egyptians were early pioneers of boat construction and design. But was their nautical expertise so great that they could produce vessels strong enough to carry obelisks weighing hundreds of tons? One pharaoh left compelling evidence that they could. Her name was Hatshepsut, and she seized the throne from her young stepson around 1470 BC. One of the few women ever to rule Egypt, Hatshepsut displayed a pharaonic beard and celebrated her reign by raising four gigantic obelisks at the great house of Amun in Thebes. Across the Nile, at her mortuary temple, Hatshepsut bragged of transporting two of these monoliths down the river from Aswan. To help interpret the evidence, Mark welcomes on board nautical expert Owen Roberts. A lifelong sailor and boat builder, Owen specializes in reconstructing ancient vessels. This is one of only two scenes that I know of that shows moving a weight of many tons by boat. On the wall of Hatshepsut's this temple is a carved left. relief. We're extraordinarily fortunate to have this. It does look rather high out of the water, doesn't she? For Although much of the wall is damaged after 3,500 years, Mark and Owen can just make out an image. Two obelisks lying on the deck of a boat. But how is such a vessel constructed? The Egyptians left behind some intriguing clues. Tomb and temple walls are covered with images of boats. Noblemen and kings were buried with miniature replicas of the fleets they captained in life. But perhaps the most amazing evidence was found here at the foot of the Great Pyramid of Khufu. I was wondering if given your... Zahi Hawass, director of Giza, now oversees all excavations on the famous Pyramid Plateau. In this discovery, no one can believe that it can happen. It happened in the summer of 1954 that King Faisal of Saudi Arabia was visiting the pyramids. And they found there is a big mound of sand located on the south of Khufu Peram. In 1954, one of Zahi's predecessors, Kamal El Malak, was in charge of the site. They began to clear the sand. Then during that, he found there are 60 large limestone blocks. Each one weighed about 16 tons. 